Thank you all for joining us for our third uh, public lecture in our spring 2021 webinar series. My name is Amy Merkel and I'm a research scientist at LASP and the current lead for our Office of Communications and Outreach. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter this evening, Dr. Kevin France. Dr. France is an astrophysicist and assistant professor in the Department of Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Dr. France received his PhD from the John Hopkins University in 2006, following a postdoc at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics in Toronto and a NASA Roman Fellowship, he moved into his present position at the University of Colorado. Dr. France's research focuses on exoplanets and their host stars, protoplanetary disks, and the development of instrumentation for space astrophysics. He is a regular guest observer with the Hubble Space Telescope and a me member of the LeVar Science and Technology Definition Team. Dr. France is a principal investigator of several NASA-supported sounding rockets and small satellite programs to study exoplanet atmospheres, and those programs allow to test out equipment for uh, bigger mission programs. Dr. France will be speaking about some of those missions tonight. Tonight. Thank you, Dr. France, for joining us this evening. I'll now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, thanks to everybody for logging in. Let me uh, get my slides fired up here. Um, and let me get the inevitable Zoom bar out of the way. Um, yeah, so thank you uh, for logging into the uh, last public lecture series. Uh, um, like Amy said, my name is Kevin France. I'm uh, a professor in the APS department here at CU. Um, what I want to tell you about tonight are some of the extrasolar planet missions uh, that we are operating or are developing, helping to develop for NASA over the next, um, well, uh, almost 20 years, as I'll, as I'll uh, show you a little bit later. Um, so uh, I want to kind of take a multi-tier approach to this. I, I want to tell you about extrasolar planets because they're cool and exciting. You know, this is the big picture questions like, are we alone? Um, and then I want to talk about, you know, how are we going to answer those big picture questions? Like, how are we going to actually go out and find Earth 2.0? Um, how are we going to understand how the some extrasolar planet's parent star interacts with that planet to determine its characteristics? Um, so I'll talk about those future missions, but then I'll also talk about smaller missions that we're uh, building or flying today uh, here at LASP uh, to support those future kind of uh, more grand uh, NASA missions. So um, I'll get to a, a summary or an overview slide in uh, in a few minutes, but, but first I want to just kind of take a step back and, and when we talk about extrasolar planets, you know, what for me, you know, there are all sorts of extrasolar planets. There are Jupiter-sized planets. There are Neptune-sized planets. Um, for me, the thing that uh, that I get up in the morning for is the search for another Earth. You know, is there another place in the in the galaxy in the universe that has uh, Earth-like conditions? Um, so, what do we mean by Earth-like conditions? So. Um, astronomers have a very simplified view of what might be the best place to look for um, inhabited planets. And we call this, oh boy, didn't start. Uh, okay, uh, we call this the habitable zone. So sometimes you hear this referred to in the, um, in the media as the Goldilocks zone. So this is this uh, green area here. This is the solar system, the cartoon solar system for scale. Um, it's the orbital distance where a rocky planet could maintain liquid water on its surface for some fraction of a year. Um, now this habitable zone distance, this Goldilocks zone, depends on what type of parent star uh, the planet's orbiting. For stars that are cooler, like red dwarf stars, this habitable zone will move in. And for more massive, hotter, more luminous stars, this habitable zone moves out somewhere, somewhat. It's, you just think about it as a, it's an energy balance. If the star is putting out more light, um, you have to scoop further back to, for the planet to capture the same total amount of light. 
So just to put it in some context, uh, so here's the solar system at, uh, and so we live in the habitable zone at about one, what we call one astronomical unit, one Earth sun distance. Um, around a hotter star, this habitable zone may be out to say two astronomical units, two Earth sun distances. Uh, but for red dwarf stars, which are quite small and, and faint, uh, the habitable zone can be quite close to the parent star. So actually anywhere in as close of a few one hundredths of an astronomical unit. So well inside the orbit of Mercury. Um, so it's these red dwarf stars that are probably, these are the most numerous stars in the galaxy. And it's probably going to be these types of stars where we're able to first look for uh, Earth-like planets, rocky planets. And we're going to start doing that with the James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, after many delays, uh, we hope launches later this calendar year. Um, so this is really interesting uh, because this means we're going to actually have the ability to start searching for the signs of life in the atmospheres of a small number of planets. Uh, Webb is, is not that big of a telescope. Um, but there's a, a bit of an issue with these red dwarf stars. Um, unlike our sun, which is a relatively mellow middle-aged star, uh, these red dwarf stars hang on to really high levels of what we refer to as magnetic activity. So this is the, the stuff that you see there in the, the little animation that gives rise to stellar solar flares and um, coronal mass ejections. We'll talk about what the, all those things are in a little bit. Um, but these stars give off high levels of ultraviolet radiation, X-rays, uh, things that are probably uh, bad for whatever uh, potentially habitable planet is orbiting these, uh, these stars. So, um, so this kind of breaks down our challenge into two parts. We need to develop the technology in the, the space missions uh, to actually find these planets around other stars and to, to observe them uh, in such a way that we can search for the signs of life in their atmospheres. Uh, but we also have to be cognizant of what type of star that uh, the planet is orbiting, because uh, a different star means a different planet. And we'll talk about both of those aspects uh, over the course of the talk tonight. So I mentioned that this star that hangs onto its magnetic activity is sends out a lot of ultraviolet light. So what do we mean by that? So let me just uh, start with the kind of the, the simple spectrum. This is the, on the top plot here, is the full electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I'm zooming in here in the middle to just the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is the part of the spectrum that our eyes are sensitive to. Um, so, but it's really just a tiny part of the overall magnetic uh, electromagnetic spectrum, which runs all the way from gamma rays at very high energies um, out through the light we see, into radar, microwaves, and all the way out to uh, long wave uh, things like AM radio um, and low frequency communications. So we're going to be focusing uh, today uh, when we talk about these host stars and uh, these, these planet hosting stars, we're going to be focusing on what they're doing in this uh, this kind of nasty region of the ultraviolet, which is uh, an important part of the spectrum to uh, study if you want to understand the impacts on planets, and, and in, in particular, a planet's atmosphere. So, you know, lights of all, light of all different energies, uh, all different wavelengths plays important roles. This, uh, this visible light wavelength, an infrared wavelength uh, light, it warms a planet, um, and then these higher energies, this ultraviolet light and these X-rays, uh, they really dominate the atmospheric processes. So they're uh, the uh, this this ultraviolet light. Um, let me actually put some wavelength ranges on here, just for the aficionados here. Uh, so below here, I've put the wavelengths in nanometers when I refer to something called extreme ultraviolet or near ultraviolet or far ultraviolet. Um, so this determines what the photochemistry. Um, how atoms are, and molecules are destroyed in the atmosphere, and how, um, how the star deposits heat in the, uh, the planet's atmosphere. So each of these different parts of the ultraviolet spectrum are important, and they, uh, they really regulate what type of atmospheres we're going to hope to find on extrasolar planets. So uh, in the talk today, I'm going to focus a little bit on finding the planets. 
And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to focus on understanding the stars that the planets orbit. And when we talk about that, we're really going to be focusing on these, uh, these damaging ultraviolet wavelengths. I mean, I guess it's, you know, one person's damage is another person's, uh, you know, career study. <laughs> so, um, but these things that, you know, that really have a big impact on, uh, on the physical conditions in a planet's atmosphere. So here's an example. This is a simulation of some, uh, it's a simulation, but inc incorporates some real data from the MAVEN mission, which is a mission that was led here at, at CU, um, to study atmospheric loss processes. So atmosphere that's no longer bound to the planet is escaping to space on Mars. Um, so what we found from MAVEN and what we, uh, what we simulate for extrasolar planets is that if you have enough of this high energy radiation, enough of these uh, ultraviolet photons from the star, as well as things like stellar winds and coronal mass ejections that I'll talk about in a little bit, um, that you can actually drive very, very rapid atmospheric loss rates. So Mars is kind of a mellow case. You know, we think that Mars used to have a habitable atmosphere. Um, over the course of 4 billion years, um, that atmosphere is a combination of uh, been, I guess, reabsorbed is, is maybe the right word, um, into the, the mantle, but also largely lost to space. So um, we actually expect that this process could happen much more rapidly on extrasolar planets, um, but we just don't know because we don't have enough understanding of what the planets are like and what the stars are like. So that's what I'll talk about. Okay, so how have we, how have we gotten to today? Well, uh, for extrasolar planets, the, the Hubble Space Telescope has really been the workhorse observatory um, for finding exoplanet atmospheres and um, as well as understanding their host stars. Um, I came to see you almost 14 years ago to work on an instrument we built for the Hubble Space Telescope. So I, uh, I have a long-term uh, affinity for the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, as you remember, they were going to cancel the last servicing mission sometime in the mid 2000s, and that gave rise to the uh, the Hubble Hugger movement um, that eventually got the the last Hubble servicing mission reinstated when the astronauts went up in uh, 2009 uh, to repair the gyroscopes and uh, put new instruments in. So, anyways, but Hubble is uh, Hubble turns 31 years on orbit um, in a couple of weeks, so that's pretty old for uh, a, a space anything. So it's time that we really start talking about where do we go from here? Uh, what, are, what are the tools of the future if we want to find this, you know, uh, an Earth 2.0? And, um, and then what are the tools we're going to need to understand the, the, the parent stars of these planets? Um, and so there's a kind of a cheesy mantra that's, uh, that sometimes goes around when we talk about the parent stars, and this is know thy star, know thy planet. And so is just emphasizing the importance of understanding the parent star if you want to understand uh, the conditions on the planet. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to, I'm going to, actually I think I'm going to show you my, yes, yeah. so this brings me to my outline. So this is going to be kind of the high level overview of what I'm going to talk about today. I already did the beginning, so we'll cross that out. Um, so I'm going to really just start big. I'm going to talk about the most ambitious, ambitious mission that NASA is in the process of designing and for development over the next 15 or 20 years. It's this thing called Louvoir. I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, and this is going to be the vehicle. This is going to be the only way that uh, humankind is going to go out and make a statistical study of the frequency of life beyond the solar system. So we'll talk about that. Um, that's uh, building a giant ambitious space telescope is hard and we need to develop the tools for that today so, um, so we can do it on budget and roughly on time. So then in the second part here, or I guess item number three, I'll talk about some of the technology development that we're doing here at LASP and testing on sounding rocket flights uh, to support these future missions. Um, and then we'll break into, at part four here, we'll break into the the parent star discussion, and I'll tell you about um, a mission that we're building, well, we're, we hope to be building. We're selected for a concept study here at CU called ESCAPE. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll wrap up our mission discussion by uh, telling you about NASA's first exoplanet CubeSat, which is uh, uh, called CUTE, and it's also something that we're doing here uh, at CU. 
Okay, so let's jump into it. So how are we gonna find these planets around other stars? Um, so the way that we're probably gonna do this is with a tool called starlight suppression. So a star is really bright and the planets that are around it are really faint. So uh, for context, if we were to try to observe Earth around the sun at some large distance, Earth would have about one ten billionth the brightness of the sun. So that means there are 10 billion star photons that arrive for every one planet photon. So it's like, you know, very much looking for a needle in a haystack. So we've got to find a way to block out some of that host star light. So we have a prayer of finding those faint but very interesting planets that are orbiting them. So um, we do this with a couple of different techniques. Uh, the one that uh, is most popular today is called coronography. This comes from studies of the sun's corona, where we put, uh, it was actually started, of course, when we would have uh, uh, eclipses where the moon would go in front of the sun and then we would observe the corona. But today we make human uh, made coronagraphs that block out the starlight so we can see the orbiting planets. And so this is the technique that this uh, Louvoir mission is going to adopt. And so what does Louvoir stand for? It sounds French, but it's just an acronym. Um, it stands for the large UV optical, there's the O, infrared IR uh, surveyor mission. This is a, a large mission concept that NASA is uh, evaluating right now. It's actually being evaluated also by the National Academy of Sciences right now. Um, so it's kind of a, you can think of it as a super Hubble Space Telescope. It's like Hubble for the 21st century. Um, so uh, just to give you a, some context for the size, um, here is a, a movie of the Louvoir telescope being uh, unfolded and deployed on, uh, not on, on really on orbit, it actually would go out further into deep space. It wouldn't be in, or, um, it wouldn't be in near Earth orbit. Um, and just for comparison, uh, how big is, is big? You know, we say Louvoir, that the L is large. So here's the size of the Louvoir meter, a tel telescope about 15 meters in diameter. Uh, for, and for reference, this is the James Webb Space Telescope. And poor old uh, 2.4 meter Hubble, uh, the, best, the best we've got today looks small in comparison. Um, so this is where the 757 in the title comes from. So uh, the Louvoir telescope has the sun shield to um, allow it to stare into deep space without getting glints of the sun uh, uh, reflected into the telescope. And this sun shield has an end-to-end -end size that's about the end-to-end -end size of a Boeing 757. So put some, uh, some, some context on it. Okay. So, what does this data look like when we have this coronagraph? So we, we go out and we observe, we're observing this star here at about 30 light years away from Earth. Um, so the coronagraph blocks out the very bright light from the star um, and allows us to see the faint glow of uh, the planets that are around it. So this is a simulated picture of what the Earth would look like, at, at, I'm sorry, what the solar system would look like at 30 light years. Um, and you see we're barely able to resolve uh, Venus. It's sort of right at the level of, of detectability. Um, Earth is the, the shows up as the famous pale blue dot, and then we would see Jupiter. Um, so why do we need a, a large telescope? Well, our ability to separate small features on the sky is directly related to the size of the telescope. So if we want to actually be able to separate that Earth that's really close, comparatively speaking, to that nearby star, um, we have to have a pretty big telescope to be able to, uh, to make that separation. But it's not just being able to separate the planets to find them. Once we find the planets, we want to take a spectrum, again, to our idea of spectroscopy and, and the electromagnetic spectrum. We want to take a spectrum of that planet to confirm that it has the same signatures that we would see in Earth's atmosphere. And so what are those things that we look for? Well, here in green, I show uh, this is a a unitless, almost unitless spectrum of uh, what Earth's atmosphere looks like. So there are a few notable features in Earth's atmosphere that we want to look for in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. So we have a, a, a rise on the blue end. This is the, the we would be the what we call Rayleigh scattering. This is the why the, this, the daytime sky is blue. 
Uh, we would want to look for things like molecular oxygen in the atmospheres of this planet. Um, on, on Earth, we wouldn't have this if we didn't have a photosynthesis and so an active biology. We'd want to look for what we think is a prerequisite for life as we know it. Uh, so water vapor, uh, this is something else that would have a spectral feature that we would search for. And then, um, and then what we would call disequilibrium gases, gases that we would not expect to exist in the absence of life, uh, things like methane, uh, for instance, on Earth, would be signs of um, an Earth-like biosphere on, um, on another rocky planet. So these are the things that we're going to look for once we're able to separate the star from the planet. Um, but why do we need a big telescope? Because these planets are faint. And if we're actually not just going to take an image of it, but then spread the light out into all of its colors, uh, we have to have a giant telescope to collect enough light to be able to uh, get a spectrum like this to confirm that this is, in fact, an Earth-like planet, not just a barren rock that happens to be orbiting this star. And then the last uh, reason why we need a big telescope is because we want to be able to do this for more than just the nearest two or th the, the closest two or three stars. Um, you know, we can survey the nearby uh, solar neighborhood, you know, stars like Alpha Centauri and, um, and then, you know, maybe a, a few stars that are, that are similar distances. But that's kind of a, you know, if you don't find anything, what do you learn from that experiment? Um, did we just look in the wrong place? Were we unlucky or we just, life is not super common, but uh, without a large sample size, uh, pulling concrete uh, conclusions out of your detections or non-detections of Earth-like planets is a little ambiguous. So the idea behind the L and Louvoir is in part to collect a large number of these planets. And so with this uh, Louvoir mission that I'm talking about, we would expect to find about 55 Earth-like planets, um, you know, making lots of assumptions about how common life is and how common planets are around other stars. Um, but folding all those things in, we would expect to find 55. So if we find 200, that's amazing. Life is even more frequent than we thought. If we find 55, well, we've about confirmed what our expectations are. But if we find zero, and we expected 55, um, that's a very significant non-detection, right? We would become, I think our uh, scientists' view of how unique our place is in the universe would probably change dramatically uh, if we found no biologically active planets beyond the solar system in an experiment like this. So three reasons, one, we have to find the planets, Two, we have to have enough sensitivity to take a spectrum of that planet. And three, we want to look at a lot of stars with planets. Uh, so that's the idea behind an ambitious mission like Louvoir. Um, in a lot of ways, Louvoir is kind of like taking a space telescope and turning it to 11, if you're a fan of Spinal Tap. Um, so just to, to give you sort of, sort of like a framework, um, we hope to start on this mission in uh, probably late 2021 or 2022. We expect it to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 billion and um, not be ready for launch until the end of the, the next decade. Um, yes, if you've got uh, anybody who's followed the James Webb uh, story for a while might have questions about this, but I'll just go ahead and leave it, uh, leave it at this for now. Okay, so if we're gonna spend all this money and we're gonna turn our search for life beyond the solar system up to 11, we really need to be able to hit the ground running and we can't afford the cost or schedule of figuring out how to do the technology uh, while we're building this mission. So we need to do all of this precursor work today so we're ready to build this ambitious mission in the future. So that's where the LASP sounding rocket program comes in. So um, LASP is, I believe, unique uh, at, a, at a universities in the US because we have actually three different sounding rocket, NASA supported sounding rockets here, two that, uh, that do astrophysics and one in solar physics, so studying the sun. Um, NASA's uh, rocket program is sort of a, I think of it as a three-legged stool. Um, on these rockets, we do unique science experiments. We develop technology for these future missions. And we train students, engineers, um, and early career scientists. So I'll, I'm not going to talk a lot about the science we do on sounding rockets today. 
I'm going to focus a little bit more on the, uh, the technology development and, um, and how we train students. So um, what are some of the things that we're doing? So I'm just going to show you as an example this, this um, instrument that we're, we're flying right now called Sistine. It's a terrible acronym, so I'm not going to tell you what the acronym stands for. Um, but Sistine is doing a lot of technology development work for this Louvoir mission. Uh, two things that I'll mention. Um, it's developing these enormous new detectors. So 220 millimeters on a side, you know, that's over eight inches. So if you think about the size of the, the CCD chip that's in your, uh, your cell phone camera, um, Louvoir is gonna need things that are, you know, many factors of 10 larger than that. And then we're gonna have to figure out how to tile them all together. And so uh, we're doing technology demonstrations of these large format detectors that Louvoir is going to require. And we're flying them. Well, we're figuring out how to build them in instruments, doing the calibration, figuring out all the lessons learned. So they're ready to go for Louvoir uh, as we begin to build that in, in later in the 2020s. So we're building these large detectors. The other thing is that um, to do Louvoir science, we actually need mirrors that are more sensitive over a broader range of wavelengths than we have currently available. So for instance, the, the type of mirrors that are on Hubble wouldn't work for Louvoir to do all the science. So um, that's another thing we're doing on this Sistine um, sounding rocket payload. Uh, we're, we are uh, doing the development and testing of these new coatings for mirrors. So what do we do? We get a glass mirror and we lay a layer of aluminum on it and then as you're probably aware, aluminum oxidizes really quick, which ruins its reflective properties. So uh, we're developing these new coating techniques to allow us to uh, preserve the reflectivity of aluminum to meet all of Louvoir's uh, science goals. So this is uh, some of our students. I can't remember who this is exactly. But maybe that's me. I'm not sure. Um, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, where we uh, partner with NASA to uh, do the first test of these advanced optical coatings, these telescope coatings um, on large optics. So uh, this is going into a coating chamber just before it had been coated at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, this is the, the, the mirror after it had been coated. And, um, and this is where this mirror would go inside the uh, Sistine rocket. So this is a telescope that we would fly inside a rocket. Um, let me tell you what we're gonna do with this. Uh, oh yeah, first let me say something about the um, anatomy of uh, NASA sounding rocket mission. So this is uh, another one of our payloads that we launched um, a few years ago from White Sands Missile Range. Uh, you see a bunch of our uh, graduate students here, um, some that have graduated already um, and some that are soon to graduate in the program uh, coming up soon. So uh, we here at last only build the part that's in this box up here. We build the science experiments. We don't build the boosters and we don't build the uh, telemetry and attitude control systems. NASA supplies those uh, to us for the mission. So, um, so let me show you a little bit about how we do this. So, so all of our payloads here from last fly these two-stage um, uh, rocket motors where we have a a booster motor that gets us off the launch pad and fires for about five seconds, then it falls away. And a sustainer motor, this is a, a Black Brant sustainer, uh, then burns for about 30 more seconds, gets us to about Mach 7. Uh, we pull something like 13 Gs. Um, so the payload has to be extremely robust um, or it would just basically be shaken to smithereens. Um, and again, these we don't can't put can't put people on a on a rocket like this. So this is the type of motor that NASA uh, provides. Uh, it's a partnership with uh, the Navy is where part of these boosters come from. Um, and then NASA also provides the front end of the rocket. So the recovery system, meaning the parachute that comes out as we uh, come back to Earth, the attitude control system, how we actually guide the rocket in real time during the flight, um, this thing we call boost phase guidance. Uh, this is something that is actually built by Saab. Remember they, when they built cars, now they just build these things. Um, and this is something that helps keep us pointed straight as we're going through the dense part of the atmosphere to get us up. And then, uh, and then they, NASA also provides the telemetry system. And these are these three bands here are actually different radio antennas that send our data down to the ground in real time so we can control the, uh, control the rocket vehicle. 
So we bring all these things together with our experiment. We take it to White Sands Missile Range or some other cool place. Um, we work for about a month integrating it all and testing it with the NASA engineers. And then um, if, if, if you're having a good day, you get to launch and everything works great. Um, and the, the student gets their, their doctoral dissertation data um, and everybody lives happily ever after. So um, where are we going next with this program? Well, we have the next flight of Sistine next summer. And um, uh, we're actually flying two rockets uh, side by side to study uh, nearby uh, exoplanet host star. We're going to observe Alpha Centauri. Um, we're going to do two rockets uh, that observe in different parts of this ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, and these are parts of the ultraviolet spectrum that are not accessible to uh, observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope or X-ray observatories like the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So we need rockets to actually fill in these gaps um, to allow us to make these observations. And now you may be um, familiar with uh, Alpha Sen. You know Alpha Sen's in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, we can't just go down to White Sands Missile Range. We don't have access to the Southern sky. So NASA is um, going to take uh, several of these rockets down to Australia for the first Southern Hemisphere launch in, geez, uh, what will then be about 30 years, um, maybe 25 years. Um, and so they've set up a, a launch range with a, um, a private space company up here in the Northern Territories. This is like one of the most remote places ever. It takes about three days to get there uh, flying from, uh, from Boulder this little town called Nilamboy. And it looks really beautiful. And there they have beaches and, um, and beautiful waves and stuff. But I was talking to the locals and they say, yeah, that's really great. The bad part is you can't actually go near the water because uh, this part of the Northern Territories is the saltwater crocodile capital of the world. Um, so not just Australia, like the whole world. So, um, so it should be a great place to spend a couple of weeks <laughs> when you're not attacked by the snakes or the saltwater crocodiles. So anyway, so we're hoping to launch uh, Sistine from Australia um, next summer to observe this Alpha Sun system and test this technology for these future NASA missions. Okay, so um, I want to talk about the last part of our uh, presentation here relatively quickly so we can wrap up in time for questions. Um, so we're going to shift to the, the last part of the talk here, which is where we talk about the impacts of the different types of parent stars that the planets go around. So this is just the same slide as we showed before. Now, you know, a different type of star means a different type of planet. Um, and we looked at this figure, and we talked about the different types of ultraviolet light. Uh, the one that we're going to be most concerned with for, for this example is this part of extreme ultraviolet light. This is the, these uh, photons from the host star penetrate into the upper atmosphere where they break apart atoms and molecules and enable those atoms and molecules to escape to space. So if you let that process happen rapidly um, and over long time scales, you can actually lose an entire atmosphere. So you can take a habitable planet and turn it into an uninhabitable planet if this atmospheric escape process is rapid enough. Now, uh, so we want to use this information to understand which are the most promising star-planet combinations where we should invest our resources uh, in a mission like Louvoir coming down the pipe. Um, Unfortunately, we don't know much about this extreme ultraviolet light from these parent stars because NASA has never built an observatory capable of detecting extreme ultraviolet light or coronal mass ejections uh, from your sort of run-of-the-mill exoplanet host star. Um, the, so they've never been able, they've never had an instrument capable of doing a survey of potential um, exoplanet candidates. So with that idea in mind, a few years ago, I guess two years ago now, uh, we at last proposed something called the ESCAPE uh, mission to NASA. NASA has a line of missions called Small Explorers. Um, ESCAPE is, is, a, is kind of a better acronym, I think. It's uh, called the Extreme Ultraviolet Stellar Characterization for Atmospheric Physics and Evolution. Um, 
So uh, about a year ago, NASA selected us and one other mission to do a, uh, a one-year, $2 million concept study. And so there was a big pool of missions that were submitted. Two were selected for these concept studies, and uh, that's where we are now. And NASA is going to down-select to the final mission, uh, hopefully later this year. So what does this escape mission do? Um, escape studies, essentially, is, is a high-sensitivity, extreme ultraviolet observatory. Um, and with this high sensitivity, we'll be able to make this first survey of this important EUV light. This is sort of 80 to 8 to 80 nanometers. Um, we'll be able to see the signatures of uh, coronal mass ejections. So we see this actually by observing flares on these uh, other stars. And the coronal mass ejection shows up because in a, in a coronal mass ejection, we actually, well, it's what the name says, it's a, an ejection of mass from the corona. So it actually blows material out of the corona. And so when that happens, if we watch the brightness of the star in this extreme ultraviolet light over time, the star gets fainter after the flare because there's less material there to glow to emit this, uh, this ultraviolet light. So what we would see is we would see a bright flare and then we would see a dimming. And, and this dimming would last for several hours until the, the corona was essentially kind of refilled with this hot gas. Um, but this is the signature that we look for that NASA has also never had an observatory to actually go out. We don't really know if other stars um, have these events the way that, that we see on the sun. So ESCAPE is gonna not only observe all of the, make the first survey of this extreme UV light, but it'll also go out and detect coronal mass ejections from other stars uh, for the first time. And again, all these things are critical to building a roadmap for the most uh, promising exoplanet, habitable exoplanet candidates. Um, I won't tell you too much about the uh, instrument in the interest of time, but it's got this fancy grazing incidence telescope, which is what allows us to get the high sensitivity. Um, and we have uh, partners for with NASA centers and um, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and different, uh, different partners contribute different parts to the mission. And our spacecraft is, uh, is developed and built by Ball Aerospace, which is uh, also in Boulder, uh, which actually normally makes a uh, collaboration very easy. But in the last year, of course, has been, uh, we've all been talking remotely anyways. So, uh, so what's the story with ESCAPE? So we're in this phase A concept study now. We hope to hear good news from NASA in about October. Uh, we would then build the observatory and launch in August of 2025, and we would carry out this, this survey of extreme ultraviolet light and coronal mass ejections from nearby stars over a, a two-year science mission, slightly less than two years. Okay, so this is ESCAPE. Um, the last thing that I'm going to tell you about quickly is NASA's, so this is about escaping atmospheres. Well, from Earth-like planets, NASA has um, uh, funded us here at LASP to build the first small satellite mission devoted to looking for escaping atmospheres from Jupiter-sized planets. And it's the, the last mission I'll tell you about tonight. It's called CUTE, the Colorado Ultraviolet Transit Experiment. Um, it's kind of a double entendre because it's a catchy acronym, but it's also reflective of the actual size of CUTE. It is in fact CUTE. Um, so this is the size of CUTE in centimeters. And the closest analog that I've been able to find to it is the family size Cheerios box. Um, so this is the size of CUTE and this is the size of a, a family size Cheerios box. It's not exact, but you know, it's pretty close. Um, and so uh, this is a mission that we are, um, we are building, almost done building now, uh, to observe transiting extrasolar planets. So um, you may be familiar with this transit technique. This is how the Kepler mission or the TESS mission, which is operating now, found thousands of planets around, um, around stars in the galaxy. Um, how deep we see this transit when the star, the, sorry, when the planet passes in front of the star, how, how deep that light curve dip is, is proportional to the area of the two bodies. So um, you can think of it like this. The depth is the, the planet's radius divided by the star's radius squared to make it the area. 
Now, if we can not only just measure that, but we can also take a spectrum while we're doing the transit observation, uh, we can use the power of spectroscopy to measure the composition and the temperature and the escape rate of atmospheres of these planets. Um, so that's what uh, CUTE was designed to do. CUTE is too small and not sensitive enough to make these measurements of Earth-sized planets because Earth is really small, so it's got a small RP making the signal size quite small. But for Jupiter-sized planets, where the radius might be 10% of the star's radius, uh, we can actually measure all of these properties, uh, even with a relatively small telescope. Um, and there's a bit of a technology innovation that allows all this to, uh, to happen. Um, astronomers think of telescopes as usually being relatively circular things. Uh, so this is a, a CubeSat that was built by MIT and JPL. It's got a, one of these circular telescopes, but that's kind of limiting in a small satellite that's the size of a, of a shoe box or the size of a cereal box. So we had the idea a couple of years ago, so why don't we build a bigger telescope and just cut off the parts that don't fit? So what CUTE does is fly a rectangular telescope. Um, and if you, you do the math, you can actually have about three times more collecting area out of this rectangular telescope than you can um, from uh, a circular telescope. So uh, this was kind of the, the innovation that allowed us to uh, do something that was compelling, make these compelling observations of um, the atmospheric properties of uh, Jupiter-sized planets around other stars, even in this tiny little uh, form factor. Um, so let me show you that telescope uh, in, in real life. This is the flight telescope before it was integrated into the uh, spacecraft. Um, so you see that's the rectangular shape and it's got these veins on it that hold, this is the secondary mirror here. These veins are really thick, probably more thicker than I would have liked, but this is uh, what's required to stop that telescope, that secondary mirror from flopping around when the thing launches. Um, this is one of our graduate students uh, doing calibration runs on, uh, on the telescope earlier in the project. So she's actually developed an entire little uh, telescope calibration test bed in our labs uh, on campus. And uh, same graduate student and one of our uh, postdoctoral researchers um, uh, a couple of months ago uh, installed the instrument into what we call our long tank facility that we usually use to test rockets. Um, and are able to ver verify and demonstrate the performance of this instrument um, uh, like where, where we simulate a star and then um, are able to do actual real end in data simulations. Uh, and this is a blow up of, uh, that's the CUTE instrument on a test plate inside this long uh, calibration chamber. So we pump all the air out of here, shine ultraviolet light in and, uh, and calibrate it that way. Oh, yes. Uh, and so we also partnered with Blue Canyon Technology, which uh, used to be in Boulder, but they've since expanded so quickly that now they've got a gigantic place over in Lafayette. Um, uh, Blue Canyon Technology provided the, the spacecraft for CUTE. So this is just an idea about just to show you how the solar arrays are expected to deploy on orbit. So we'll come out of the, the launch vehicle. This pulls a little pin that tells it to turn on. and then allows the, the solar array deployment mechanism spring-loaded to happen. We really, really hope this happens in space. <laughs> um, and in uh, a way we go, powering up and observing um, exoplanetary atmospheres. Um, we also do all of the operations on campus here at LASP. So we have um, one of the, I guess there are a couple across the country now, but a, a, a student-run um, small satellite operations center here at LASP. So this is where we'll do the commanding for CUTE. And so you might say, uh, when are you going to launch? Well, CUTE is gonna launch as a secondary payload on the Landsat 9 mission. Uh, NASA's Landsat 9 was delayed uh, partially because of um, delays to the, to the Landsat 9 mission, but also in large part because of COVID. So, um, so we're hoping that CUTE launches as a secondary payload on Landsat 9 this September. Um, and it would then carry out about an eight-month science mission um, studying about a dozen of these, these Jupiter-sized extrasolar planets. 
Okay, so I'm about uh, ready to wrap up here. So um, in closing, let me mention one thing that you've seen sprinkled all throughout this talk, um, and those are our students. Uh, so one of the things that's really cool about doing all of this work at a university is that we have the opportunity to work with undergraduate um, and graduate students and early career scientists and engineers uh, to, uh, to do all these things, to do the science, to do this technology development. It also keeps the whole process quite fun. So um, we have a tradition in our group that the lead graduate student on one of the rock on the rocket mission gets to decide what silly outfit the whole team is going to wear when we fly out into the desert, uh, white sands, uh, in an army helicopter to recover the payload. So this was Carrie Hoadley's PhD dissertation flight. So she decided that superheroes were the way to go. Uh, so she and some of her um, compadres. Uh, flew out on this uh, in these outfits and uh, to pick up her her thesis rocket. Um, so we have you know students get involved uh, particularly through our program, but uh, the Colorado Ultraviolet Spectroscopy Program, but also through a number of programs uh, here at LASP where we have hands-on um, uh, um, exposure to not just uh, not just spaceflight mission data, but actually doing the development of these missions. Um, being the, the people who build the hardware um, that then they see go into space and then also use the data. Um, also, they get experience working with large international teams because these projects um, tend to have large collaboration teams. Um, so uh, it's a really great experience for the students. And like I said, it, it keeps it fun. So, uh, right, so this is, uh, you know, these are all the people that are out to support one of our sounding rocket flights. So this, uh, you know, all these people were flown to the Marshall Islands uh, for about six weeks to support um, one of our graduate students' dissertation flights. Um, so uh, it, it also, I, it's, it's a humbling experience, but also really um, uh, brings the students into the process and gives them a sense of the investment that they're in charge of. <laughs> um, and, and I, I think this is, it's a really unique uh, way to do uh, graduate and undergraduate education in space sciences. Um, so it's something that's very neat and, and rather unique to the things that we do at LASP. So, um, so that's all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, as a quick summary, I won't read all this, but we talked about extrasolar planets, how we're gonna find them with future missions, uh, how we're building the tools today uh, to allow us to have those missions, um, and then we kind of walked through a couple of different things that we're doing here at last. Uh, and always we have an emphasis on um, getting our students involved. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for coming today. And I'm happy to stick around for a while and take questions. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. That was, that was so interesting. I learned a lot. I work at last, but you never know what your colleagues are doing. Um, so we're gonna open it up to questions. Um, there's currently three questions in the Q&A. Um, please type in your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to get to them. Um, okay, so we'll start with this one and uh, Kevin, you're more than welcome to open up the Q&A and, and look at them as well. Um, but I'll read the question and you can read along with me and then uh, you can answer. So, um, with uh, starlight suppression, it seems we rely on the planet having an orbit plane, which happens to make the exoplanet pass between Earth and the star the exoplanet is orbiting. Is there any way of detecting exoplanets that are not causing starlight suppression as viewed from Earth? And is there any estimate of how many exoplanets we may be missing due to this? Thank so uh, it's a good question, Ryan. Um, so it works, uh, it works a little bit differently than that. So that transit method that I was talking about, where the, the star, where the, I'm sorry, where the planet goes in front of the star and blocks out a little bit of the starlight, um, that relies on a very specific geometry. That's right. The, the, basically, you have to be edge on to the, to the planetary system. But the starlight suppression doesn't rely on a planet to, uh, to block out the starlight. Inside the coronagraphic instrument, um, you can think of it as like having a little finger that comes down. And if my, my face were the, uh, I don't know if I can do this on Zoom. If my face were the, the star, it has a, essentially a mechanical um, um, object in the light path of the instrument that blocks out the starlight. So 
In that case, actually, the face-on orientation is the easiest thing to see because then you have the, the, the largest separation of the star and the planet. So the transit method, you're right, relies on, um, on having that very specific edge-on geometry. Um, this using a, a coronagraph for starlight suppression is much more um, relaxed than, uh, the, the requirements are much more relaxed than that. And is actually uh, does best with systems that are kind of like, you know, either face on or 45 degrees. Um, so we expect to, to be able to capture uh, probably more than half of the total systems um, uh, we, we would expect just out of random orientations to find like that. So um, it, it, for the starlight suppression system, it's not a big limiting factor. Okay, um, the next question is, is why do we need grazing incident optics for the UV? Higher reflectivity at every reflection? Good, that's also a good question. Um, so uh, think about when we talk about high energy radiation, um, think a little bit further past the ultraviolet and think about x-rays and um, think about your experience with x-rays, right? We, we use x-rays to, to x-ray us because they go right through material. Um, the same thing is true with a telescope. If you have a telescope with a regular normal incidence geometry like the Hubble Space Telescope, um, those x-rays or the extreme ultraviolet light is just gonna zip right through that telescope. So we go to this grazing incidence geometry. So when the light comes in, it sees a longer path of telescope um, at, the, at the atomic level. And so it has a higher cross section for interacting with that mirror. And so we build these grazing incidence telescopes to increase that cross-sectional interaction um, because high energy radiation um, will pass right through thin optics. So it'll go right through an optic that's normal like this. But if we turn it like this, it's sort of like seeing the uh, um, uh, seeing the forest for the trees. Anyway, uh, bad analogy. But anyways, we, we turn it like this so, uh, so we have a higher cross-sectional area for those uh, photons to interact with the telescope surface. Okay, so the next question that came in um, is basically asking about CUTE and after its eight, eight month mission, what happens to it? Does it just become stable <laughs> or what is the deorbiting scenario? Yeah, uh, so no, um, NASA has a requirement for CubeSats that they come back in and burn up in Earth's atmosphere in less than five years. And uh, so CUTE is anticipated to have uh, just over two years before the atmospheric drag brings it back in. So um, it'll go up, hopefully it lasts all two years. Uh, if, you know, if the instrument is healthy, we'd like to work all the way up until it re-enters, but it'll burn up in the atmosphere after about two years. Okay, and then, um, so how long can a sounding rocket take data for? Is it common to launch multiple rockets to get more data? I assume it's um, the same time is what they mean. Yeah, hi Sierra. Um, we, uh, we observe for, a, well, depending on the mass of the payload, because that depends on how high you get and how long you're above the certain atmospheric height. Um, we observe between five and 10 minutes. Um, so it is, a, it is a lot of work and a lot of pressure for a relatively short observation. Um, and yes, actually it is, uh, it's not so common in astronomy, but it is uh, common in um, like space physics disciplines where they study the aurora or, um, or studying atmospheric density from sounding rockets to shoot multiple rockets to, um, to basically capture a, a bigger science picture. Okay, um, the next question is, does the quality of the data depend on how far away the light blocking piece is from the sensor? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and the development of those coronagraph instruments is, um, is an entire uh, relatively expensive cottage industry. Um, you know, the, the first coronagraphs were uh, created by uh, French opticians in the 1800s. Um, but the things that we need to build to enable Louvoir, you know, where we actually have one part in 10 billion starlight suppression um, are very complicated. In fact, even building the facilities to test the, to test at that level um, in a laboratory 
is very challenging. So, um, so yes, it's very sensitive on exactly where all the optics are placed and, um, and, the, and must be held very stably or it throws off the starlight suppression. Okay, the next question is, do you expect by the time Lavoir flies, other miss missions such as Kepler, TESS, ESCAPE, ground-based Doppler observations or others will have compiled a useful catalog of host stars with tantalizing planets? Yeah, hi Dennis, uh, nice to virtually see you. Um, Yes, uh, Louvoir will leverage uh, the results from not so much Kepler because a lot of those planets were too far away for detailed follow-up, but definitely tests and, and ground-based observatories um, will help hone the target list for Louvoir. Um, so I, I think we're gonna have a pretty good idea about uh, where some of the most promising planets are, but, but probably not all of them. Well, certainly not all of them because Remember, finding Earth-like planets around sun-like stars is still hard. TESS can't do that. Um, so we're, we're still going to, uh, well, TESS would have a hard time doing it. TESS won't find a lot of those. Um, so we're still going to rely on Louvoir's uh, dual role of finding the planet and then characterizing it uh, to, to, to build that large sample size. Okay, the next question, um, how do you determine exoplanet distance from its star? Um, oh, so, okay, so it's, uh, if, uh, if you remember, what's the, what's the trigonometric uh, Pythagorean theorem? Anyways, so we, we know the distance to the star because uh, we can uh, measure its motion across the sky with uh, its parallax angle. And then once we know the distance to the star, and we can measure the angular separation between the star and the planet, um, we can, because we know the physical distance, we can put a physical distance on that star-planet distance and um, have a, a pretty good idea about how far away the planet is from the star. The other way that you can do it is if you have a transiting system, we have the systems where the star blocks the planet or the planet blocks the star's light, um, you get a very robust measurement of the period of the rotation and um, from Newton's laws, then you can, you can back out the distance between those uh, with high fidelity. Okay, the next three questions have to do with cute. Um, these first two are, are similar. One says, is cute powered? How does it stay aimed correctly? And the other one is, how does cute control its orientation or how does it know where to look? while in orbit. So those are kind of the same. The same, yeah. So um, if you remember that solar array deployment video that I showed where the, the solar arrays flopped out. Um, so CUTE has solar panels that point at the sun to charge up, that charges a battery, and the battery runs the, uh, the telescope. Um, it also has uh, on board what we call reaction wheels, which is um, sort of like a, a, a fancy application of a gyroscope. And um, it uses those reaction wheels to uh, change its orientation. It's in low Earth orbit, so it's going around the Earth. And as it goes around, it's going to point at some distant star planet system. And it uses those reaction wheels to tilt around to uh, point, at, point at and stay stable while observing uh, those distant targets. OK, and then the next one is um... Are there any tricks that CUTE uses to achieve greater dispersion of the light within a small CubeSat volume? Uh, yes, uh, so CUTE has, I don't, didn't show the, the light path for the instrument, but yes, CUTE uses um, a magnifying optic uh, in the system to basically increase the, even though it's all packed into something that is literally about this big, um, it bounces the light back and forth a few times in there. So it, um, it essentially has a magnifying impact on the on the light. It increases the dispersion that we're able to achieve, even in that that tiny little package. Okay, that's all the questions that are in the uh, Q and A. Unless anybody has any more, but I wanted to ask a question. So, have you already been chosen to um, participate in LUVAR and? with your sounding rocket instrument or are you preparing to propose to LUVAR? So, uh, so LUVAR um, uh, was a somewhat unique in that uh, in order to avoid a lot of the mistakes that were made with the, or the 
mistakes is the wrong word, but a lot of the challenges that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope faced in terms of budget and schedule, NASA conducted a four-year, extremely detailed concept study of Louvoir before the, the National Academies of Sciences uh, considered it. And so um, I was selected to be part of that science and technology definition team for Louvoir. So we uh, identified what we thought were the most important science cases, um, helped develop the, the mission profile. And then actually at last, we developed and designed and developed one of the instrument concepts for Louvoir. Um, so we were part of the NASA team that did that. And we were actually the only university team to develop an instrument concept for any of any of those large missions uh, that are being considered by the National Academies now. So, so yeah, so we're part of we're part of the team today. Um, I would think it's probably likely that if Louvoir is uh, really selected for funding start in 2021 or 2022, that they would probably reevaluate the teams. Um, so we would then need to repropose, but. Uh, as it's slated, Louvoir is basically designed to fly a last instrument um, uh, on it. Um, and that instrument, like how big is Louvoir? Is it is it as big as Hubble or is it? Uh, yes, um, it's much bigger than Hubble. Uh, so uh, Louvoir's telescope is about six times the, the diameter of Hubble. So um, it... Uh, the instrument itself, uh, our instrument itself, is about the size of a college dorm room. <laughs> um, okay. So it it uh, it's I can't remember the exact dimensions now, but um, there's actually enough space. We didn't need the full volume that we were allotted. There was kind of like enough space to put a futon and and uh, a micro fridge down there. So um, it's uh, it's it's very big. Um, and how many instruments? Are those there, there are four envisioned for Louvoir. Um, the one that we built was the the ultraviolet or that we designed was the ultraviolet spectrograph. Um, there's also that coronagraph, which is designed to to find the planets, um, and then another imaging camera to to well to do lots of good science, but also will take you know uh, sort of imagine all the amazing pictures you're used to seeing of galaxies and nebulae from Hubble, um, but like a hundred times better. Um, that would be also produced by Louvoir. And I see Arvin's asked if it'll overlap with Hubble. And I would say almost certainly, I mean, ho I hope Hubble lasts until the late 2030s, but, but probably not. Um, okay, and then I had just one more question. So what's your next CubeSat mission after Cube? Oh, good question. I, I, I need to go on vacation for a while. Um, uh, we, we proposed, I, I'm not the principal investigator, but one of our um, scientists here last, Allison Youngblood, uh, proposed a CubeSat to NASA this year. We're waiting to hear back on it's called Buffalo, which is sort of an homage to, uh, to the CU. Um, and it's, uh, it's also designed to go take images in this ultraviolet, uh, extreme ultraviolet light that we talked about. Um, it's basically kind of uh, taking uh, images of a smaller number of nearby stars to look for flares and, um, and again, similar ideas, similar uh, impacts on potentially habitable planets that we'll be orbiting. All right, well, thank you so much for, for joining us and giving this incredible talk. You're doing incredible things with incredible technology. It's very exciting to hear about. So thank you very much. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a, it was a pleasure.